I just actually, I, I, I'll have you know that I actually did live here in Nevada for uh, roughly almost three and a half years, so in the early 1990s. So it's, it's nice to be uh, it's nice to be back. The last time I visited was uh, about 13 years ago. And actually, um, it's I, I just want also just a few words about Ken uh, Ken Zong and uh, Zong Engineering. You know when Quantech first. Uh, started surveying here, we, they're, they're searching for the best equipment available and, and uh, you know uh, Zong and uh, I mean, Quantech represented a potential uh, competitor, they rented us uh, equipment and uh, treated us just like everyone else and the nice thing about Zong was uh, they also had uh, you know, guides to interpret and, uh, their, their data, they were very very um, open minded and uh, I think that's in the spirit of, uh, of Ken. And uh, how open he was to uh, to share ideas and and, and uh, information. So I think I get a gathering like we have here today is uh, I think he'd be very much in approval of that. So, anyways, that's my thoughts on Ken Zong. Um, and speaking of uh, sharing of ideas, I before I start here this particular talk, I prepared this talk uh, for a workshop in, in at the PBAC, and um, they asked me to make a presentation. I didn't want to make it a I want to make it kind of like a general presentation on you know examples of uh, uh, multidisciplinary methods over uh, uh, porphyries in, in the Canadian Cordillera. That's a big mouthful, anyway. Uh, and I thought about it, and uh, so I, I put I, I was you know I, I I I decided that I would instead of using my own results uh, or our, our own results, I would try to you know. Use, use the work from the other. So I submitted the, it was the same deal as it is here, a month before they asked us to present uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation a month before the PDAC in early February. And so I did, and about two weeks later, I, I received the manuscript from uh, uh, um, uh, Richard and, and Ken's paper that they were presenting, which is the basis of Richard's paper this morning that we saw. And I looked at it, and there's, you'll, and you'll see also there's a lot of similarities between the two. And, uh, and uh, mine is more of a focus on how 3D immersion relates all the various techniques together, but basically you'll see a lot of uh, similarities. There's similar images in both our presentations, but I swear uh, I had mine in first. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, here's uh, just my outline. I just introduced, I'm going to show you some multidisciplinary airborne ground. Examples. The first one being Mount Elgin. What we've seen, and you'll see a lot of the same, the same images, but just, just different taken as well as pebble. Uh, and, so, and then I'll wrap up with the, with the silver queen, which you've also seen, and I've got a, a, a slightly different take on it from an inversion standpoint. And you all know the Mount Elgin deposit very well. I mean, I didn't know it very well, and so it was, it was a nice example of the The nice thing about it. Uh, uh, besides the fact that it's uh, it, it isn't uh, an alkali copper gold porphyry, so it's 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 atypical. It's uh, there, the the the, the um, uh, there's monzonitic stocks. The alteration is a lot more subtle than a lot of the booming um, uh, responses we get from other porphyries. So uh, it's an interesting case in that in that way. The mineralization is associated with the mineralized with the monzonite stocks, and the the, the uh, there's host within volcanics. And uh, the stratigraphic tree's been tilted. Uh, and the neat thing about it is the geology is well known. The geophysics is available in the public domain. So as a result of that, it was actually studied actively. And, you know, that's the reason why the University of British Columbia uh, Geophysical Inversion uh, uh, Facility uh, published a number of papers from 1997 to 2012. So it's a really interesting uh, example of, uh, in case studies, but also showing the evolution of inversion uh, with, uh, with data. So this is a, this is a, this is an image from a paper by uh, Kowalczyk and uh, Espinoza uh, that I actually attended the uh, it, uh, Sergio actually presented the talk at, at the PCGS breakfast one year and it, it just shows here that just the difference between the regional magnetic image when you're looking at a regional magnetic coverage versus a ground magnetic coverage using much smaller the point that I want to make then is resolution really depends on the sample density. These are eight, this is data from 800 meter line spacing, this is data from 50 meter line spacing, which I thought was interesting. The other aspect of it too was, um, when, they, when this is from the work by Diane Mitchinson, whose her name was cut off at the bottom here, but it's still present here. Anyway, she showed uh, how magnetic susceptibilities on the rocks had this kind of like bimodal distribution. If you take a look at the, 
the, uh, the, the various basalts, uh, potassium altered, sodium altered, propylytic basalts, the uh, potassium altered monzonite and sodium altered monzonite, they had these two uh, distinctive uh, uh, populations and that, that was related to alteration. So the physical property of aggregation, you know, in, in, we, we think of constraint inversion wanting to do constraints based on methodology, but there's always that overriding alteration also has an influence. So that was the point that uh, I wanted to make there. In this case, the, the magnetic inversion uh, fit the data quite well. This is the magnetic 3D magnetic inversion section. Uh, and uh, from Oldenburg at all, 1997. And this is the rock model. So there's a very good correlation between the uh, the high magnetic susceptibility of the potassium alteration, and that was predicted in the magnetic susceptibility model. <coughs> and then in, in the example here that I showed, which Richard also showed, it just shows uh, by using, uh, you know, although the unconstrained inversion um, basically keys in on the NBX stock up here, the other, the southern star, and the, the, the 66, I believe is what it is, don't actually show up as well. When you do introduce the, the geological constraints, it actually um, um, uh, helps uh, solve the, uh, uh, um, it's, and it's not only the fact that they have magnetic susceptibility measurements here, but it actually, in the image that Richard showed that I'm not showing here, but uh, it actually extended the, um, the volume of, uh, of the magnetic anomaly, uh, the, so the constrained inversion actually agreed better with the, not only the near surface geology, but also what was going at depth that didn't have uh, a priori information from. Just looking at the DC resistivity data, um, uh, this is, it's, it wasn't, it was, it's, it's N1 to 4 equal 50 meter along these lines over, directly over the star. Come on. There we go. And so the DCIP properties assume uh, best estimates of the electrical physical properties, but my own thing, uh, thing on this is that we have to be aware of the um, 2D, 3D nature of the inversion models. So these are 2D inversion models here. That the, the, Chargeability, if you don't know, the actual NBX stock is in the middle, and the, the chargeability highs on the edges are due to the um, pyrite halos and the, and the, the fillic alteration on the outside. And you see here the, the, the potassium alteration and, and the, uh, the, the IP highs are associated with these uh, maroon colors rather than the uh, mineralized core. This is the, uh, and I, I remember looking at this and being very confused. I looked at the um, uh, when the uh, uh, resistivity from the frequency to medium, and we could see all this layering that's not explained actually in the resistivity model. And the same with the, the, the resistivity conversion was a little better. We we're seeing high, resistivity high near the surface, but as they went down to depth, we could see like uh, a, a decrease in resistivity, and that actually doesn't fit the, uh, the, the, the geologic model or the petrophysical model. And when, uh, from a paper by uh, Holtman, uh, that's not true. It was it was the Tico and Yang uh, and and um, Oldenburg uh, showed results of three a three D DC resistivity. Basically, this is the the uh, the uh, GoCad model and this is the three D resistivity model showing like a resistor. And again, at a deeper depth slice, it was also showing the resistor. So whereas the one D and two D DC and EM inversions indicated more of a layered resistivity, the three D DC resistivity actually indicated that the stock was resistive from surface end to depth, so it actually agreed with the geology. So that's confusing. Why was that the case? Extending this further to helicopter timing in the end, we saw, we saw this image in Richard's uh, talk. And so they, they, they organized a survey of uh, d lines, actually, over the, over, over the stock that covers uh, the, the, the stock. And uh, they showed you know, the resistivity uh, zoneation uh, uh, predicting uh, the, uh, the the outcome, but when they actually did the survey, they found that the the stock uh, in, the, in the time constant showed the stock was the MDX stock was conductive, and uh, as well as the one D resistivity also showed that the stock was conductive. And Richard mentioned that today, so it actually disagreed with the known geology and the petrophysics. And then, and as he showed, it wasn't until they actually did three D inversion that they showed actually that it showed that the crock of the stock was correctly resistive. And it harkens back, uh, this actually slide uh, reminds me of, of um, when, I, when I attended the talk at, at uh, the, the BCGS breakfast, Sergio uh, had presented the results of uh, the time to medium, and 
Actually, at the end of this talk, he complained that you know, the, there must be something wrong with the, uh, the time of EDM survey, the helicopter time of EDM survey, because it didn't show it showed that the it didn't show the stock to be sufficiently conductive. It, it, he was, but there is no secondary enrichment in the in the stock in the MDX stock, so there's no. And the petrophysics also said it wasn't conductive. It said it was, should be predicted was resistive. So why is that? And uh, in, in this case, the the three D model. Uh, shows, uh, of, the, of the helicopter time medium shows that. So why is there a discrepancy between the 1D and 3D? And Richard in, uh, talked about this a bit, but uh, not in its entirety. And um, This is from a paper by Yang and Olderberg in 2012. Uh, Deacon Yang, and he showed, here's, they got a 3D conductivity model of a porphyry. So they got a potassium altered uh, core uh, that's resistive, fo followed by this Philic uh, halo, the pyrite halo, and some overburden up top. So that's the 3D conductivity model. When he did the 1D inversion result, what was surprising was instead of seeing a resistor in the middle, it saw a conductor. So basically, what happens is as the as the smoke ring expands, instead of looking at the resistivity vertically, it actually looked. It was actually you're actually scanning the uh, the, the the Philic alteration on the outside. So that was the reason. So for us as geophysicists, up until we actually saw the end, here's the 3D inversion result. The 3D inversion result predicts predictably that you would see uh, that you would see this as a correctly as the inside would be uh, fantastic, well would be resistive, followed by a conductive outer shell, and that's what the 3D inversion model, of course, of the time of the media show. But up until that point it hadn't because of the, the, the analysis had been in 1D. So I I think, you, anyways, the idea is, and although uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the phyllic alteration was detected as a false 1D conductor layer, and the 3D inversion accurately saw the 3D nat nature of the resistivity model. That's kind of like astonishing, but it kind of like lends to the point is that that's why I, my, my idea here is, and you'll see, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to drone it in you, is actually I think that 3D inversion. Um, Actually, has a way of has a, has a, it has a way of unifying many of the different technologies. Things that we, when we're looking at it one D or uh, if, if we actually looked at it as a as a three D problem correctly, it actually unifies all of the all of the geophysical models kind of like match up better rather than contradicting each other. And uh, to, to top it off, this is the AFNAG results uh, that uh, uh, they, they showed. Also, they just just showed the. Uh, Inline, uh, inline in phase. Well, these are just the raw data that, that they collected. Um, Z10 is a resistivity uh, mapping tool. It's, it, 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 I, I consider it just as a re resistivity mapper, uh, it, in spite of the fact that it's, it's, it's a passive EM technique. It just, I just see it as a deep penetrating resistivity mapping tool. These are the conductivity results that we talked about. Um, and you can see here quite subtly, it's a very, very subtle resistivity high. And in as much as it doesn't look very impressive, I remember Peter Kowalczyk uh, at, at, a, at, a, at one of our, um, we have a mini symposium at the PDC, and he, he, was, he was talking about the Z10 results from his perspective. And you know, he's, he was the uh, you know, chief chief of the at Placer Dome, and then, uh, then uh, eventually went to, to Barrett. But, so he would know a few things about porphyry copper deposits in, in, the, in the Mount Milligan area. He was, he, he was with Geoscience BC, and at, at the time he was like jumping up and down about this result, and we were going like, why? That's pretty subtle. And I think the reason for it was that up until that time, all the airborne geophysics that he'd seen had never seen, it, had never seen the, the interior of the stock as being resistive. And it was the, the first, the, so when we saw the Z10 in 2009, that's the first time he actually had evidence that the airborne geophysics or whatever had, had, was agreeing with the petrophysical data and, the, and what they had on the ground. So that's why he was excited about it. So in as much as it's a very, very subtle response, it was a resistive response, and that's why, and that's why they were, uh, he was excited about it. This is the uh, Z10 2D inversion of it, and I, although it's, I, I, I know like my slides are always ultra small, uh, but what I like, what I like is interesting is it, it basically shows that the yeah you know we're actually mapping the. Uh, the uh, the port potassium altered core and and uh, and uh, its it, and, and, and uh, increased conductivity surrounding it. This is this was an image that uh, it's a contentious image, but it's an image that Ken, that Doug Oldenburg presented at 2009. Here in 2009, we were presenting two-dimensional inversion results, which I think was fantastic. We just 
developed, uh, had Phil Wanamaker help us develop a 2D inversion code for ZTEM, and I was showing 2D inversion results for the first time, and you know, Doug Oldberg walked up and said, well, here's my 3D inversion model. And I, I, didn't, I had no idea. What's interesting here is, this is just a cross-section, and in white, if, and you'll see in the, in the image, in white is the, the geologic context from the GOLCAD model, and this is the inversion uh, of the ZTEM data in 3D. And so the MDX stock is correctly dipping, it's resistive, and the, and the fillet hail over here on either side that are, that are pretty, uh, uh, are, are correctly labeled. And that's a pretty darn nice image. And I remember at the time, uh, and let alone that's, and that was obtained from a, from a helicopter EM survey flying uh, 100, 100 uh, kilometers an hour and 50 meters off the deck. I mean, I'd be happy if you could do that with a ground survey system. In, in our version here, they could do it from a. So, like, to me, this was the ability uh, to be able to map resistivity, and of course, like Don says, like resistivity, a high resistive a feature uh, in one geologic environment might mean a different type of geology elsewhere. He showed us an example where the, the porphyries were conductive. In this case, the porphyry is, uh, the stock is resistive, but it, it, that's a. a I, I got me excited about it. And again, this is uh, the, the, three, the larger 3D model showing. Resistive core and conductive fillet halo. Pebble again, uh, and we, we saw this before. Uh, um, Pebble West uh, and East. The, the West is known. It was it was known. Uh, um, uh, it's a 5.9 volt billion ton uh, billion ton uh, uh, deposit. Uh, it's a, a cow cow pellet porphyry, so it's uh, associated with granite and diorite intrusions. It occupies a massive five by three kilometer area. And uh, Pebble West outcrops was discovered in 1994 because of outcrops. Pebble East was only, was only discovered in 2005 because it's buried below up to 500 meters of this uh, um, tertiary material. So here, this is actually the ore, the ore, the ore shell. And you can see it's, it actually increases in, uh, uh, it's, it's secondary enrichment and increases in, in, in grade uh, uh, at Pebble East. What I thought was interesting, and this comes from a paper, it doesn't show it here, but uh, on the side, uh, so, uh, I, I'd asked, how much time have? Not too bad. I'd asked uh, Pascal Paré to, uh, if you know, he might, we, we flew this test survey over, over at, our, at our cost, and uh, at, at Pebble, and uh, I'd asked him if he would, um, you know, co-write co a, a paper on the, for the SCG, expanded abstract. Um, and, uh, he agreed, but not only did he agree, he actually, they were, they were very generous. He, he, he showed me all these results and he agreed to show uh, a variety of different uh, um, airborne and ground survey results along with it. So this is the ground DC resistivity survey, and uh, I'm not showing the IP, but you can see here uh, the, the outline of the two deposits. You can see like the interior of the, of the deposit is like more or less resistant, and you've got this uh, conductive outer core. And you, you don't see it so much in the you don't see it at all, actually, in the Pebble East because it's deeper than the DC resistivity uh, penetration was available at that time. So when they ran the survey, they actually didn't know that Pebble East existed. These are, and just to compare, they, these are the spectrum results in Pebble East and West over there. So it just looks like a, a big conductive feature. And here's the ZTEM results, and the ZTEM, uh, we, you, Yet what, what, what we see is, you see there's the, the in, in interior looks like a resistor. This kind of like donut shape is a fairly typical uh, sh shape that we look for when we look at, uh, for pebble, uh, for uh, porphyry copper deposits. We look for that metastatic altered core and, um, and uh, the phyllic altered uh, alteration on the outside. It doesn't work, in other areas where you've got secondary enrichment, it's, it's never, it's not nearly as clear as this, but even here where they do have secondary enrichment in my, my we, we see this, so that's a, really neat pattern, which uh, we, I, we're not showing here the outside, uh, that was flown in a commercial survey, and uh, we weren't allowed to show those results, but um, uh, you, when we assume that you'd see uh, a similar uh, uh, aureole on this side. But uh, the point I wanted to make was that there's a multiple data sets and they all look different, and as a geophysicist this is frustrating because we've got three tools that supposedly measure resistivity, and they're giving us three different images, isn't that typical? Uh, but I'm going to show you another image, and this is actually, and I was speaking with Richard about this, and when I saw this, it was from a paper by uh, Holden and Oldenburg at ASCG 2012, uh, they, they presented an abstract, but this is actually a slide 
that he showed, and I almost fell off my chair, because uh, this is a 3D inversion of the DC ground resistivity. This is a 3D inversion of the spectrum airborne M results. This is a 3D inversion of the Z10 airborne half mag, and I want to just point out to you, like, they look really similar. Like, and they we're using the exactly the same resistivity color bar. So from the image we saw yet before, where they all look different, to an image now where we we're basically get the same information. Now, all the systems don't have the same sensitivity, they don't have the same bandwidth, they don't have the same penetration, they don't, but here we, we actually, it was only, it's actually through 3D inversion that we're actually able to kind of like look, finally look at, you know, uh, we're mapping resistivity with these three systems and we've got three similar images not only they look similar, they've also got the same color bar. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come a, we've come a long way. Uh, this is th this type of image really made me a believer uh, in three D inversion. In as much as you know, my own company, you know, we 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 uh, we went out and uh, purchased the uh, UBC three D uh, code uh, uh, subsequent to seeing results like this. But anyway, the the, the, big, the idea is. is that and my premise here is how a 3D inversion basically helps us unite widely different data sets. Now let's look at Silver Queen. It's situated uh, in central BC, 36 kilometers south of Houston. <laughs> Houston, British Columbia. That's the old Silver Queen uh, vein that they, that they uh, discovered in 1912 in mine in the 70s. It's an intrusion-related vein type mineralization. It's, it's suspected to be related to a flow freestyle. Deposit, but I, I don't think that that's that yet, that's yet to be proven. These are the Z10 results uh, over. And what's interesting here is that that's the where the Silver Queen is, and um, there's a massive power line that runs down the valley west of the deposit here. And uh, in the um, Kowalczyk and Van Kooten, and actually I, I do want to mention, actually Patrick Van Kooten, uh, uh, sad to say, he passed away earlier this year with brain aneurysm. It's very tragic, and I, I feel um, uh, I thought, thought I would mention that it's uh, really, really too bad. This was uh, he, he presented this uh, at, at uh, one of our workshops, and uh, I feel, uh, my, my condolences to him and his family. I thought his family. I'm sorry. Anyway, the uh, the IP res the uh, IP resistivity survey was uh, had been conducted sh shallow survey conducted in 2005, and had ad identified the things. And later, uh, in 2011, we ran a Z10 airborne and mag survey with follow-up uh, by ground in 2011. And the 3D inversion analysis were done by Mira. And the 2011 drill program, that very same year, based on the Z10 led to the discovery of the porphyry. So within one field season, uh, they, 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 it led to a discovery of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an occurrence, and that's great. And what I thought was interesting is, when, is the, the approach that Peter had. He had these criteria for, uh, for a buried bulk tonnage target, and one it had to be close to mineralization. And when they plotted the mine workings, uh, um, there was a corroborating resistant feature seen uh, in, at the surface uh, with, in the Zentech version. And he felt that uh, the other criteria for bulk tonnage target had to be close to the boundary of the intrusive. And uh, the intrusive boundaries were, were interpreted using the Z10 magnetic inversion uh, results. In the third case, it, it had to be a regional structure within a thickening of a structure or a kink or a dilatational zone, transferring movement between parallel zones. I mean, that's what he said. And so, uh, I'm sorry, and, and that in, indeed they, uh, Z10 linear lineaments and magnetic loads were defined these uh, brecciation zones, potential brecciation zones. And finally, he said in his own of increased penetration, these were uh, interpreted, uh, the area was interpreted from the Z10 version. This is, this is a Peter's slide from that uh, presentation at ASCG. So like, as Richard showed, this is uh, just a 3D version of the uh, uh, magnetic data, and it shows uh, uh, you know, higher uh, 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 0.2 SI ISO surface. You can see this kind of like structure, and this is, this is, this is where the uh, Silver Queen vein was, and you can see there's this kind of like inferred offset in the, in the, in the fault structure. So this was immediately an area that they thought was, was, was interesting and inviting. You had this uh, um, uh, additional 
adaptational structure that they were that they were interested in seeing. These are the ZTIM IBM results, and what's interesting here is that we see the, the stock only has a magnetic susceptibility high, but it's also a resistor with, with slightly more conductive phase or resistive phases within them. And then we, there's this uh, conductive lineament, and not only does it, uh, and it offsets into another conductive lineament over here, and then back again uh, across the, the, the power line lies through here, so. It, uh, but anyway, across, uh, across we, it, you see that offset. And this is just a, an image showing uh, the ZTEM uh, uh, result from the 3D inversion model. And we're, we're just going to show the results uh, versus the geology in this kind of like little film. So as we, we, we reduce the opaqueness, and you see the geology in the background. So you see the, this fault, where am I? This fault here that they that they uh, inferred in the geology that we're also seeing in the, in the stocks themselves. And we'll, we'll go back to the ZTIM image from 3D inversion again. And it, it fit quite well. This is the section through the ZTIM inversion model showing, uh, just the north south section through, uh, through the ZTIM inversion model showing the, uh, it, the silver print. Where's my, where's my, oh, I lost the pointer. I've been pointing too much. Anyway, here's the silver queen vein, and what interested them was there was a resistive cap. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, and this uh, Zentin very target that interested them. So on the basis of those results, they designed a, a type, the Titan survey to follow up in that area. And uh, these are the charge, 3D chargeability results that identified uh, the results associated with uh, um, uh, the exit vein, but also a deeper target. And here it is here. And uh, when they when they drilled it uh, through the, uh, they identified they they carried on the drill and and, uh, and found deeper mineralization uh, down to 777 meters, which was great. So in conclusion. Porphyry, yeah, thank you. Uh, porphyry, that's amazing. I, I, I gave this talk in 20 minutes at the, at the PDAC workshop. Anyway, uh, I was obviously rushing. Porphyry copper deposits have been extensively su suffered, but only with the advent of 3D inversion. I think that actually the deposit response to geophysically can be properly compared based on the derived physical properties. And Mount Milligan, uh, it was studied with 1D and 2D, and, uh, but really, the, the more recent 3D uh, DM electrical inversions provided a consistent result between the circuit types. Uh, the calc outcome program is the best example of consistent resistivity model using the inversion of ground and airborne TM, I think. And Silver Queen demonstrates the successful application of ZTEM aeromagnetics as a reconnaissance tool, followed by Type 24 ground follow up in an integration using 3D inversion, and that led to the discovery of. Uh, I think that's stretching uh, uh, of, of an occurrence, potential deposit in a single field season. I'd like to thank all these authors who contributed all the slides. Almost, I think uh, there's only one image that was mine. And uh, I'd like to thank Terry Minerals, Anglo-American, uh, Northern Dynasty, the Pebble Partnership, and Unity and Exploration. Thank you.